Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for joining us today. This is, I think, a unique session here at the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's designed to tap into the voice of the next generation. I've been doing this um, annual shindig for, for some years now, and I think this is uh, one of the best panels that I've been asked to moderate, so I'm really pleased that you're all joining us today. I'm Becky Anderson, a presenter at uh, CNN, in case you don't know, very much feeling my age as I do midway through this annual meeting after hours of anchoring in the cold, um, but it's not my voice you're here uh, to hear, it's the voices of our fantastic panel after an exhaustive process, and we're going to see a short movie about that. Before we start, six youngsters from around the globe have been selected through the British Council's uh, global network to join us here to discuss what influences are shaping their uh, views and concerns. You'll hear what they care about and why, and perhaps more importantly, and I'm not going to beat around the bush here, more importantly, this is about what you can do for them. Before I give the floor to these terrific teenagers, I'm going to take a moment to introduce our other two panellists today. Emma Thompson, to my left, needs no introduction as an actress and screenwriter, has received numerous awards, including Academy Awards, Golden Globes, BAFTAs, the list goes on, she has them all. Uh, but what you may not know um, about Emma is that she is a tireless campaigner on behalf of refugees and against human trafficking and the global sex slave industry. And Mrs. Sadato Ogata, on my right, whose professional life spans more than four decades spent efforting an improvement in human rights around the world as UN, the UN's uh, High Commissioner for Refugees between the uh, years of 2001 and 2003 and most recently as the Japanese Prime Minister's Special Representative for Afghanistan Assistance. So I thank our panellists all for being here. I thank you for being here. I hope this is going to be a really special hour here at the World Economic Forum. But before we start... Let's roll a short film. I'm 16 years old. I'm 17 years I'm old. I'm 19 years old. 17 years old. 19 years old. I'm 16 years old. Namaste. I'm Atul Lepande from Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm Northern Ireland from Azerbaijan. United States of America. From Cyprus. Nigeria. From Finland. From South Africa. From Beijing, China. And I'm from Argentina. From the United Arab Emirates. From Colombia. From Mauritius. From Japan. And I'm from Libya. Well, if I must be honest with you, some people have lost faith in the leaders because over the years they've not really seen changes. I, I basically represent the frustrated youth of my country as well as many of the developing nations. We are working on the ground and we are the change that we want to see. Activism for me is about communication and establishing relationships and networks so people can come together. As someone from a very developed country like Japan, I see that we need to help people in developing countries. It is very unrealistic for you to suddenly expect us as young people to grow into adulthood and take up responsibilities effectively if you don't involve us now. It's good for us to start now to lay the foundation for what will happen when we take over from you. <laughs> don't you wish they had more confidence and were prepared to say what they really thought? Um, we are represented today um, uh, from South Africa, Argentina, Scotland, Sri Lanka, the USA, and China. Oh, it hasn't, oh, it hasn't finished, sorry. The best decisions are the best compromises, so that's why we called for the United Nations to step in. For five days we worked constantly, sharing our ideas and experiences. Today we're in this world and it's our island and our family, our global family is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. We learn from each other on how to get our voices heard. <laughs> we danced, we debated and we created. Planning our future of activism together. Six of us are here and now. Here and now. Let's talk. Common sprat. Avelemos. Apicata. Let's talk. <laughs> Great stuff. Brilliant. Well done, everybody, and thank you all for being here. 
So we've got Juan, Unan, Nick, Gillian, Whitney and Rodina here with us and our two very special panellists as well. Um, let's kick off, I think, with Emma though, because we were talking before we started and we wondered what we were thinking about when we were 16 and just how engaged we were. And I couldn't even remember what I was thinking about at 16, so I certainly wasn't as, as engaged as any of these uh, youngsters here. But Emma, what were you thinking about? Boys. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, 16 is, is, is pretty young. I didn't get politically engaged until slightly later. Um, oh, God, how ghastly. I'm down there in front of myself. Um, um, anyway. Um, um, but, but slightly later on, I did get very concerned about an awful lot of things. And I started writing comedy because I was a comedian. So I thought, well, if I could just remember some of the things that really concerned me, when I was, you know, 19, let's say. Um, it was, well, patriarchy. You know, the fact that structures and systems were invented and mostly controlled by um, men um, had not been influenced by women in ways that women had imagined they would be when the shining light of feminism at the beginning of the 20th century um, seemed to promise so much and actually delivered not as much as we had hoped, shall we say. Um, so there was, there was that, and I, I, start, I wrote sketches about it, you know, I wrote, about, about, I wrote comedy about it. Um, I, I was worried about domestic violence, which is, of course, still very much present, and, you know, this is... This is something that uh, I think we should really address the violence against women in today's, today's world is as bad as it's ever been, if not worse. So there was that. There was nuclear weapons. We all, of course, thought we were going to get blown up the day after tomorrow. Um, but I think every generation has its own particular worries. Um, and then the other thing that, that really got my goat was body fascism, you know, body shape, um, and the way in which women were... Um, encouraged to, n n not to look like women, to look like, in fact, boys. And, um, and I'm still struggling with that one, actually. Um, so those were just four examples. And, and I wondered if we could all give like, a few examples of the things that really get us and whether there are any crossovers, whether you think any of those things have got better and the things that really get to you and what you want to do and how you want to engage with all the oldies. <laughs> Shall we start? Let's start at the... Let me, before we move on, Mr. Lukács, if you want to just uh, um, tell our audience and our panellists here what it was that was um, affecting you at that age. Well, I really cannot remember that age. It's <laughs> such a long, long time ago. You know? But I think uh, what I can say is that I w was brought up in a very nice, uh, normal family life. Uh, I went to school all right did the studies all right. I was very athletic, so I rode horses all the time, too. And then uh, I think um, it's only after that uh, I graduated from college and all that, that more, much more opportunities uh, came out for women, girls, women. And then I went to study abroad and um, to the United States. And the more you, I started studying, the more interested I got in all the international affairs. And until then, I have lots of cousins and so on, big families. So we were quite happy at school with families, uh, with our own. I studied all right, but I wasn't all that enthusiastic. I never thought I would be a scholar, which I ended up being before I became a, a, a active in international affairs, the United Nations. I was High Commissioner for Refugees for 10 years. And that really uh, shaped my life a great deal more, because I was exposed to the real harsh world that we're living in. All right, thank you okay. very much indeed for that. Let's, uh, let's find out then from these great youngsters, and I call you youngsters loosely. I mean, you know, some of you are nearly, nearly into your uh, 20s here. But let's, let's kick off and find out why you're here, really, and what it is that you care about. Let's, let's start right at the end. Introduce yourself. We've seen you on the film. Introduce yourself and talk to the audience. I'm Radina Diavis. I'm 18 years old and I'm from Sri Lanka. And something I realized was, think about how it is when you go to a foreign la uh, country. You don't know the language, so you don't understand the people. You don't know their culture, so you don't fit in. And think about how scary it would be if that happened to you in your very own country. 
What I do is I work with street and slum children who are marginalized and ostracized by society. I feel that they need someone who realizes that their, their future is up to them. And so what I do is I go out there and I put myself out there and I help these children realize that just because of where they were born or the circumstances they were placed in doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have a future. Because I truly believe that you have to be the difference you want to see in the world. And that is why I do what I do. Excellent. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Brilliant. Whitney. Hi, I'm Whitney Burton from the United States, and I'm 18 years old, and I go to university. And first I want to start with a little statistic. I'm from North America, and in North America, every single year, we spend $20 billion on ice cream. It would only cost $10 billion to build enough schools to put all the world's children into primary school. To me, this shows that it's not a problem of resources, it's a problem of allocation. If we put our ideas and our money into the right way, then we can really make a difference in the world. I believe that to eradicate poverty, all we have to do is really focus on education and also give people and countries more ec economic incentives. Because even sometimes when people become educated, there's a problem of brain drain. They leave their country and they go to more developed countries where they can have jobs and other things that they can work on. But if we can really work with the economy and create more opportunities, then the people won't have a reason to leave. And then they can also continue to build up their economy. So to work on this, in high school, I started a project called Building Futures, where we raised money to build a school in Sierra Leone, Africa, and also empowered young people to understand the difference they can make in the world and to understand what's going on in the world. I believe that we can make a difference. And I believe that together, if we collaborate, we can tackle absolute poverty. Pretty good, huh? Gillian, Whitney talking there about the, the importance of empowerment, the importance of education. Your, your concerns, your ideas, your views, you're from South Africa, of course. Yes, indeed, I'm from South Africa. I'm from Cape Town, everybody, the most beautiful city on <laughs> this planet. <laughs> I am 19 years old and I'm currently awaiting entry into the University of Cape Town, but for the last five years I started working on a project called the Unboxed Anti-Racism and Human Rights Initiative. It's basically about training young people to become ambassadors for issues of anti-racism and human rights, but not taking that issues to a serious sense, but bringing it down to the level where young people are talking about it as part of our youth culture that we are currently building up. And a lot of the work I do is trying to form a foundation, working with the identity of young people, working with the identity of young people who are in poverty situations where there's not enough hope to think about the self. And I believe it's important to focus on who you are as a person if you're going to be branching out. And it's important to look at young people in their communities and what they're doing. And that's what I'm doing in Cape Town. And this week has also shown me that a lot of things, Whitney and Radina spoke about it, all of the poverty, eradication, education, it's all to do with the self. If you are confident enough, you will make a difference. And that is what I do through my work, through identities or unboxed. Well done. Very good. Let's go left. Nick Scottish. Nick, where are you going, mate? Uh, I'm 19, yes, I'm from Scotland, and I'm very passionate about um, the rights of young lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people, the prejudices that HIV-positive people face of prejudice, and the discrimination that young people who are sexually exploited face. And I try to work with them to show them they don't have to live like that. If they um, gathered together and said, um, enough's enough, um, and that's why I try to help them with, um, by teaching them the skills and giving them the ability to, to tackle that prejudice head on. There's 95% uh, of uh, the gay community in Scotland, at least, that face uh, abuse or some sort of discrimination at some point in their lives. But there's not nearly 95% of the community involved in fighting that prejudice. And that's the gap that I try to close. Good. Lovely. <laughs> Unan. Everybody, um, I'm Yunnan from Beijing, China. I'm 17 years old. And um, before I go on, I want you guys to imagine what your childhood was like. All right, take three seconds to think about it. Okay, I'm going to count for you. One, two, and three. You all know Chinese are good at mathematics. <laughs> now, for me, childhood was all about, you know, being growing up in Beijing with a very sensitive respiratory system, and every spring, sandstorms would blanket the city. 
that's when I would cough and sneeze all the way through that season. I mean, they say spring is a season where hope and life blossoms, but that season for me was just a veritable hell on earth. So that's what inspired me to found the A Tree A Day project which, um, in 2005, in which we travel all the way up to Inner Mongolia every year to plant 365 trees. Every person plants 365 trees, representing a tree a day. And eventually, um, that made me focus my extracurricular activities and my activism on climate change issues. And here I am. Juan. Hello, everybody. I'm Juan Nacimene from Argentina. And before I started introducing myself, I wanted to point out that I do think about girls, too. <laughs> but, <laughs> now, basically, I just want uh, all of us here to think out the amount of money that a cup of coffee, when we get up desperate in the morning, costs $5 or so. Well, that's the amount of money that a family of six in Argentina, in some places in Argentina, has to survive for the whole week. We spend it on, once on a cup of coffee, a daily coffee perhaps, but they spend it on a whole week to survive. And that's a very important issue in Argentina, in Latin America, and in the whole world. Poverty is now an issue that should be tackled globally. Basically, in Argentina, we have high margins of poverty, exclusion, social and income inequality as Latin America as well. And millions of teenagers can't have access to education, can't have access to bilingual education, can't have access to their basic needs. That is why my main focus in activism is how can I, uh, I ask myself this question, how can I raise awareness of them that they, there is a way out of poverty. And that may be through the raising awareness of the value of education. I do so in, in my community in Argentina by uh, two different means. I, do it in, I started about three years ago uh, by means of my school, by going to different rural areas and uh, uh, sharing activities with them. I, I don't know, singing all McDonald's or doing different activities that will make them realize that their education in the future is a key asset. The other, the other uh, way that I'm doing this is by an individual project, an individual group project, which involves the setting up of a library and a community forum for people, youth, to have a way of interacting with themselves and with adults in a shelter home called Hogar Puerta del Cielo in, in Buenos Aires. Basically, we're here not only to represent ourselves, not only to represent the 60 in, in, in Guilford last week that you saw the video about, but we're here to speak for those people who don't have a voice. Thank you. Excellent. Inspiring and inspired, showing that age is no uh, discriminator when it comes to caring about the world we live in. You do a lot of work, both of you, um, in human rights. Does a lot of this ring true? How good are these guys? Uh, well, they're great. I mean, they're great. I met with them yesterday, and you know, you can tell a, a natural leader when you see one, um, or six in this case, and I'm sure <laughs> girls think about you too, Juan. Um, perhaps not for me to say, but um, just worth mentioning. <laughs> Uh, I think um, um, it's not, the question is really not how good are you, but how good are they? Because what I'm interested in is here we are in a very unusual situation. When I arrived here, this is the first time I've been here, it's the first time we've all been here. And um, I could feel myself rising above the ground as, as if I were some strange astronaut as gravity started to leach away and the glass ceiling just dropped. And I thought, oh, I'm miles above it now. How interesting. I shall probably never be here again. Um, and we may not be in this kind of situation again. So we could all sit around in our various countries talking about these issues very usefully at any time. But when will be, we be in possession of the opportunity to present these issues to people who have actual power? And if you do have that opportunity, what is it you want to say to them? How do you want to engage them and say, look, I may only be 19, but I've got this idea can you help me to develop it you know I mean I think this is an opportunity to ask for seed money 
um, and for um, 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 commitments from older people to young. Because after all, what this is supposed to be about is older global leaders meeting, you know, potential global leaders. And you've got to make, make links, you know, otherwise you're just going to come up and end up floating above the glass ceiling as well. <laughs> and at the moment you're at the grassroots and therefore you're in the place where, as they say in Chile, the potatoes are burning. You're in the exciting place. You're in the place where you know you can talk to people, you can talk to anybody you want, and nobody's going to be following you around, protecting you with a Kalashnikov. So, so how are you going to use this forum, and who do you think you should talk to? He wants to start with that, and I, and I hope while, while we're doing this, the audience is thinking about how they might help um, our panellists out and those others who haven't been able to be here today. Just so please do have a think about it and raise your hand at any point if you want to put a question to any of the guys on the, on the panel. Please. Yes. It's the first time I met these uh, young, young uh, ladies and gentlemen, maybe already. But I was really surprised. I have to be very honest. 16, 17, 18, I don't think I was that self-conscious or socially conscious yet. How did they become so socially conscious? And then how much of an involvement did they have in daily life with these people? They, f f all of you s felt that poverty alleviation is very important. How much have you been exposed? This is your own experience, I'm very curious to know, mm. and your power of articulation. Where did you learn the languages, even the English language, oh, from Beijing, mm -hmm. Argentina, and some of the non-English speaking places? Uh, I, I'm so, just so surprised, to be very honest. Are you exceptional? I, knew, I know you're exceptional. But are there many exceptional young people coming up? <laughs> yes. Watch out. <laughs> All right, who wants to start? There's lots of questions there you can take, whichever one you want. Gillian. I think I'll start with uh, Mrs. Agatha's last question. Where do you learn things? How do we learn as young people from each other? And I think the last week has been a testimony to where you learn. It is through cross-cultural dialogue that you solve problems. It is through meeting young people from different regions, face to face, and talking to them and asking them, what are your issues? And saying, these are mine. How can we help each other? And I think that is probably why we are here today, because we are representing a network of young people from 43 different countries around the world. Not just selected countries in different regions, but all the regions in the world. And we, look, we looked at how we could create a network of young people to reach out to you people and ask you, how can you help us? Very good. Touching up on what Gillian said and also to answer uh, Emma's question on what I expect from this forum, it's amazing to see how much unity there can be among 60 individuals from 43 different countries. And we come here, though you see the six of us, we have the backing of 54 and so many around the world. Now we know and we realize that youth who are activists are a minority in our own country. Put together, we're a minority in the world. But we have the passion, we have the zest, and we have the foresight to go out there and convince the majority if that's what it's going to take. And from this forum, if we can manage to change the opinion of one person towards youth activism, then we would have achieved our purpose. Whitney. I'd like to also answer Emma's question a little bit. I hope that by being here, I know we're not necessarily going to you know, cause rocks to fall down the mountain, cause an avalanche, but I hope that through what we say, we can add a new perspective to what you guys are thinking about, and maybe in the future, you'll think back to something that one of us said and think, maybe that's a good idea, to bring a new light, a new vision for the future. Good. Guys, yes. Nick. <laughs> um, just to talk about why we kind of do this type of thing, I'm always very surprised that discrimination still exists in the developing world, in the developed world, sorry, against uh, young gay and lesbian people and people of HIV positive, and uh, more so to realise that it's uh, so much in the developing world as well. And the fact that um, I found out a horrible statistic the other day that there's uh, 13 countries in the world which completely bar HIV positive people from entering them. Uh, some of them are Libya, China and the United States of America and I think what something we can all do is think about uh, what it's like for young lesbian gay people and what it's like for young people who have been sexually exploited who are, have become HIV positive and then the discrimination that they face on top of the, the way their lives are living now and it's, I find it horrific and I just want to share that with you and hopefully you will want to do something about that too. Guys? Um, picking up on Emma's question about our expectations, I think the six of us are here, well, 
the elder, the elder generation always refers to us as the future. You guys are the future. And of course, we are the future. But we're here to show that even though we are the future, we can still make a difference today. Mm. Very good point. Yeah, and and, I, I want to come and, back to that one. Go on, go on. And um, I think, well, they've already said we're here to show our youth activism. I think another huge part of taking part in this activity is actually to learn. Like this morning when I had to get out of bed at 6 <laughs> to attend the 7.45 morning session that featured Bono and Al Gore. Now that really educated me a lot. It gave me a whole new perspective. Mm. They talked about combining global poverty and climate change together and tackling them together. And I think that was a whole new perspective. Mm. And so that's what I'm saying. I think we're also here to learn. So you have no problem about getting out of bed either at that time <laughs> in the morning. Well done you. Go on. Go on. Basically, w what I think that we should do is uh, put aside our differences, put aside our religion, put aside our culture, put aside our differences, and truly act as a global community. And act as a, but always respecting the different cultures. I mean, putting them down that they want to be a, bar a barrier in, in, in the means of tackling the world's problems. Because it is only behaving as a, as a community and not uh, um, putting first the, the leading countries interest above the world's interest that we can truly understand and truly tackle the world problems that are completely interrelated, such as uh, global warming, uh, poverty, social and income inequality. I mean, uh, world leaders should understand that they're world leaders because of something. And the world, and the world itself says they're world leaders. So they should start acting as world leaders and not only taking into account their own constituencies, their own, I, I know they face immediate, immediate uh, incentives, you won't be re-elected or something like that, but why, why don't think globally? Why don't think how can we uh, make the world a better place? How can we create global justice? It is, it is not only about thinking what would benefit my country alone, because in this globalized world, what, where, what may affect your country alone may, may affect the other countries, and basically the countries who need it the most, the developing countries. For example, just take an example with the common agriculture policy, the subsidizes that the European Union spent on most than 50 billion uh, euros per, per annum in subsidizing the farmers, and there's so much surplus that they have to insert their products in different developing countries' uh, the markets, which completely displace the local, the local products, and th that, uh, that, farmer, that, uh, that local farmer cannot activate the economy in itself. So I think that in, in tackling the most urgent world problems, we should think as a global community. Very good. Emma, you want to come back there? Um, can, I, can I ask if, if, if any of you can tell us um, a very specific and actual stories about people that you know, that you've worked with, who you've been able to influence, um, if you see what I mean. We're talking you know, in quite sort of large abstract terms here, and I think that sometimes it's, very, it's, it's, it's easier perhaps to get your point across to... Um, describe what you believe in by telling a story about somebody you've mm. met or you've worked with and you clearly do talk to a lot of people. Could, has anybody got anything? You must have loads, Nick. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I once spoke to a, a young gay male prostitute in Glasgow and he was only about 16 or mm. 17. And uh, I asked him, I was trying to interview him to see what kind of uh, issues he had brought up and so then I could take that back to to and think about how to tackle that. And I asked him, where does he get a supply of condoms from? Mm. And he said, oh, why do I need condoms? I can't get pregnant. And that shocked me so much that the, the education system had failed this young guy so incredibly much that he didn't even know that people like him could get HIV and AIDS from, from what he had done. And I was amazed and I was taken aback, but I spoke down, I sat down and I spoke to him about it. Uh, and it just kind of, it, Opened, opened his mind and it almost turned his life around. He went on from that and is now working actually in sexual health services in Glasgow, mm. uh, helping other young people who are sexually exploited like him to kind of really tackle that and tackle that ignorance mm. that, um, that we assume people don't have, but actually is really there. Mm. Adding on to what Nick's been saying, I've, um, my last project that I'm still busy working on is called Identities. It's how do you effectively teach people in your community how they can use the arts to change the community. 
And what we've done through the education, the free education for all project under the umbrella of identities is going to talk to young people at high school level, young people who occupy leadership positions such as the student representative councils, and ask them basically who you are. And in um, one of the recent workshops we, we had, I had one of the participants, we were talking about where you come from and your identity. And a very bold comment was made that um, you are where you come from. That depends who you are. And in South Africa, we've got a deep and dark history of where we come from and how that has shaped the country at the moment. And at the end of the session, the general concession among, amongst the young people were that it is not where you come from, but where you are going. Because in South Africa, we've learned valuable lessons through, the apartheid, through apartheid and through learning about apartheid, that it is not where you come from, it is where you are going. Very good. Whitney, I know you're nodding there. You've got, you got a story for us. Me, I work a lot with young people, as young as elementary school, actually. I want to tell you a story of this one little boy who I was working with who was in fifth grade. And his fifth grade class decided they wanted to raise money to build a school. And they were telling me all about all the fundraisers they did and how they were watching the videos. And it was so inspiring for me to see a kid who was in fifth grade, grade five. I think that that's 10. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> but to see such young people, even younger, way younger than me. So it's not even just us. It's mm -hmm. people who are as young as 10, as young as six who are out there actively seeking to change the world. So seeing that person really inspired me to keep on going and to know the power that I had. I think our audience will also be interested to hear who does inspire you or what inspires you at the moment. Who do you look up to? Who do you think is really doing a good job? Who do you think is doing a bad job at present? You know, look at the... <laughs> I don't want to point anybody out. Look. <laughs> Yeah, who's doing a bad job? Um, I guess what we, you know, use, use sort of effectively bigger word, you know, inefficiencies and efficiencies in the system. Is the UN any good anymore? If it's not, as far as you guys are concerned, what should happen next? Who wants to start? Can I just add by saying that the organisation that I think is doing a brilliant job in promoting cross-cultural dialogue is the British Council, because that is why most of us are here today, all of us, were selected through a process, as you could see on the video, whereby we got together in the United Kingdom, 43 different countries got together and spoke for five days on issues that are affecting us. And it's all thanks to one organization that has worked with the World Economic Forum in trying to get us on our road to Davos. Very good. Well done. Good point. Very good. Who wants to pick up that? Right at the end. Uh, well, going back to uh, Becky's question on what inspires me, um, what actually inspires me to do what I do is the children I work with. The, I'll tell you a little story. There's a little girl, and she watched her mother, she was about five years old, and she watched her mother being gang raped, and she wet her bed every single day. But those children get up. They get out there, and they smile. When you go up to them, they're always willing to come and talk to you, ready for a hug. They take life as it comes, and when it comes, they just smile and take it. And that is what really inspires me, because they don't have a voice. We're their voice. And if we don't do all we can to help them, then what are we, we're not worth our salt. We're not worth it. Rodina, thank you for that. Me. Guys, yeah. Um, for me, my greatest influence, or should I say, um, my inspiration would be my parents. Um, because my father comes from the northeast part of China. And then my mother comes from the most southmost part of China. So that's a really long way between. <laughs> All right? Now, so how does this family reflect this really long way between? Pretty much by my father and my mother often disagreeing with each other. <laughs> All right? So pretty much it's going to be like this. I call my dad and I tell him that I want to go with a gray tie to school today. And then um, I complain to him that my mother wants me to go in pink. <laughs> so, yeah. So growing up in an environment like that, you naturally develop an open mind. Because you really don't pick favorites with your parents. You love them both. So you have to listen to both of them and then decide for yourself. And I think that's really helped me a lot, whether in my activism or being in school, just being open to all kinds of thoughts and not having a prejudice against mm. something. Mm. Go on, Juan. Basically, um, first I would like to tell you a small t story, not, just not to get you bored. But uh, I spoke with, a, I remember in a rural, one of these rural towns that I, that I work in, and in a rural school, I spoke with a with a 16 year old boy my age, and who was in ninth grade. He had repeated that a couple of times, uh, and I told him, "What are you going to do when you finish ninth grade? Are you going to continue in secondary?" He told me, "No, 
I'm going to go to work with my father and uh, in the land because I need to sustain my whole family. That's exactly the thing we should fight against. It's not that we, we, we should not uh, fight in favor of, of that kid sustaining his family, but we should fight in favor of sustaining the kid's childhood, of making sure that that kid receives the necessary education for him to become a professional, for him to earn a salary, for him not to have to work in the land, but actually to have to work in what, not only, uh, not at 16 years old, but at 25 when he gets his degree. That's the main thing I, I think we should fight in favor. And the, uh, uh, in, in terms of what inspires me, I come from a family that is very, very inspiring. Uh, my, but not my, the whole members of my family, my, my, par my parents, my grandparents, basically my grandfather truly inspires me because he is a great uh, injustice fighter. He did, we had, um, in Argentina, we had a really, really devastating military dictatorship in the 70s. And uh, he, he didn't, he didn't, he, he just went forward, he was a lawyer in that time, and he defended the rights of some workers who needed to be defended by the Constitution, although the Constitution didn't apply in that time. But he went forward, and they took him, they took him, they, they kidnapped him for 10 days, but then luckily he turned up, not as the th or other 30,000 Argentinians who truly disappeared in favor of fighting against justice, human rights, and democracy. Excellent. Is there any questions from the audience yet, or anything the audience wants to add at this point? Before we, uh, yes, over here. I'm not sure that we do. You have some microphones at this point, yes. Just have a think about other questions while while we're taking this one, and we'll carry on for a little bit longer. Um. What an amazing debate. My name is Irene Heller. I'm an independent journalist. I write for British and German papers. So I loved your comment, uh, Emma Thompson, on the strange astronaut <laughs> coming here. <laughs> fantastic. So it's, it's the word. And now I would like to ask these fantastic young, brilliant leaders, um, what would you do if you would be um, well, uh, a leader, uh, a head of state, a head of World Bank, head of uh, NATO, all these big people who are here. So what would you change? Thank you. Okay, who wants to start there? Choose your institution carefully. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Choose your institution carefully, says Emma. <laughs> Just a suggestion. Yes, I think I'll start with that. Most of you know that you've spoken to some of us um, while you were walking around today minding your own business. And you were interrupted by a young person saying, come to our session, listen to what we have to say. And I think it's more importantly thinking about what are we doing. This is what we are doing. We are telling people to listen to young people and to start getting young people's voices out there. As we are sitting here today, there are young people in destitute situations. I know of some people who are sitting in countries such as Lebanon at the moment, and they have to dodge bombs. People in Palestine and Israel, they're fighting over borders because they can't talk to their leaders. And I think the most important thing that I have to say to you today is that we are here to talk to you, but we're not just going to wait around for you to talk to us. Excellent. Well done, you. Anybody else on that point? Yeah. Something that I would like to change. Um, I think a qualified global leader should actually t he listen to voices from all kinds of people, not just young people. You know, They should listen to octogenarians, too. They should listen to their parents, too. I mean, I'm not saying that you should agree with them, but at least take it in. I mean, what's wrong with having another opinion? You get more choices to choose from. Isn't that better? <laughs> you make it so make it. what I'm saying is that if I could change something, I would just want all the global leaders to use their ears instead of just, I mean, using them as decoration for their head or something. <laughs> Use your ears and listen to the voices around you. There are a lot of smart people around you. Listen to them. You don't have to agree, but at least first take it in. You've been told. Nick? If I could be anyone then, for the next two days, I would be President Musharraf of Pakistan. Because I know this morning uh, in a session he said that, oh, it's a Western conception of human rights. Then I, if I was him, I would, I would think to myself, no, it's not a Western conception of human rights. It's a global conception of human rights. These rights that we have and that we hold dear in the West are universal and apply to every human being on this planet. 
not just those in the West. They are, they are universal and they have to be, have to be defended as such. Mm, very good point. Whitney? If I were a world leader, then I would want to remember, because I know that it's really easy for world leaders because they're always meeting these important people and people who are in movies, to get back to what, to remember what they were doing. Remember what they were thinking when they were 16 years old and to say, what, it, what do I feel is important and how can I make that happen again? And also to keep in touch with the people they're representing, to know how they feel, to know how, what they think, and to not just think, oh, okay, well, to get elected next year, I should do this, but to really work in the best interest of their people and for the whole world. Well done, you. Uh, nobody's, nobody's brought up an institution here. Nobody's specifically said, apart from suggesting you wanted to play Pervis Musharraf for the next couple of days. What about the institutions? Because we talk a lot about the institutions that are supposed to be making a difference in the world these days, those that are efficient and those that are inefficient. Now, you know, in 10, 20, 30 years' time, we won't be around playing an active role in getting these things changed. You guys will. So where do you, what, what do we need to do at this point? Any of you? I think, firstly, let's start by the looking at what young people are doing at the moment. I've met 60 young people working in 43 different countries running so many diverse projects that are effective, and it's easily implemented, it's practical, and it involves a lot of young people. And I think it's time that the world leaders, especially financial institutions such as the World Bank, you, UNAIDS, if you start going and looking for those young people and start funding projects that young people present to you, don't just look for a smart business plan that's written in perfect English because you're not going to get it. You're going to get something that is presented by young people for young people. Regina. Um, well, something I want to say is we know that the world leaders, they have a lot of challenges and a lot of decisions that they have to make. And some of us over here probably can't even imagine the stress that most of them are under. But it would be nice if, like Whitney said, they thought about what, what they wanted when they were our age. There's a saying my grandfather always told me. He said, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> so what are you going to do when you have the power in your hands? Think about where you were and the passion and inspiration that drove you to where you are at that point. And then act on it, because that is what's going to make the difference. Action, not just words. Action. Excellent. Well done. Um, we are still wondering here, you've told us what you've done and where you're from and how you've got to where you are now. What is it that you want to do next? And how can not just this audience, but how can those at the World Economic Forum help? And then just from the audience, how do you think you can help? Let me start over here before we put that to, to the guys up here. Uh, microphone here, please. Hi, uh, I'm Deb Insel. Um, I'm a director of a nonprofit organization in the United States called Reach for College, and we help uh, low income students get to college. Um, you are all saying that we should hear more of your voices, and I think we should. Can you think of a good way to have this happen and uh, to be able to have more um, interaction with other people, other young voices in the world? I'm, what comes to mind automatically is the internet. But I know that a lot of students that I work with in the richest country in the world don't have access to the internet, and I'm sure a lot of people in your countries don't either. What are your suggestions? Juan. Basically, what uh, world leaders must understand, uh, and then I ask your question, but basically, uh, develop, developed countries are facing with a really uh, important issue right now, and that is the aging population. In only uh, 2015, the developed countries, leading countries, will have two-thirds of the population over 60 years old. So the majority will be over 60 years old, and as there are their constituencies, they will follow the needs and desires of the 60 years old, forgetting the youth. With the youth, not only can produce an uh, innovative change in the future, but also in the present. So I think it's time that they realize that the youth are an integral part of the conversation in addressing the world's problems. In that manner, in that way of, of addressing the world's problems, I think a good way would be 
creating local, regional, and global forums such as this one that has was completely great because we break the barriers of prejudices and stereotypes and we truly become that global community. And that would be great, like giving the voice, the voice for, for example, um, youth parliaments in Latin America. That would be so good, so good to have a youth parliament in Latin America because we are all Hispanic countries, but why, why would you choose to go separately? We can all solve our common issues because poverty, social inequality, and millions of, of youngsters and children not be, being able to have access to education is a common problem in Latin America. So I think it's really, really good to include the youngsters into a conversation by means of local, why not regional and global forums. Good. Youth Parliament's one idea. Whitney. Some other ideas I think that you could take into everyday organizations is just to invite the young people of your area to come in and discuss with you. Give, have them give you their ideas and talk about it. Also, you can, I mean, I know some people don't have computers, but also now YouTube is starting to be such a big way for people to spread messages. So put out a question and have young people answer on that. And also have conferences where you invite young people to talk about these things, these issues that you're working on, to see their perspective. Good. Nick. Just to answer your, your, try answer your question, you know, I think the best thing that you can do and um, for when you're thinking about what to fund and what to work with is peer education projects when you have youth-led groups teaching young people how to, how to use their voice and how to, use, how to create an active community and society because once, once you've trained up a young person and once you've shown them how to use their tools and their voice, they won't ever stop. Like, I like to take myself for an example because, I mean, we, we've had, uh, I've, I've set up my own organisation which is tackling uh, young people in poverty and young people with multiple, multiple barriers like I talked about. Um, but we've got no money at the moment, so, but I just keep doing it anyway. And I've maxed out my overdraft trying to do it. But it's just, <laughs> they'll keep doing it and they won't ever stop. You'll never get rid of them if you, if you train them up. You know, if, if not a long time, three weekends training. Mm. That's them for life. They're going to never stop. I, I would like to just d describe some of my friends. They lost a son in a bomb blast in Northern Ireland during the war. And um, they started this thing called, um, it's the Peace um, Centre. And they got... Um, so it was eight kids from Belfast, eight kids from Dublin, um, eight kids from Warrington. This is, you know, Protestant Catholic interfaith, deep, deep hostility, suspicion, hatred that's been read into them from very early on. When we can replicate this all around the world in various ways, and they have a program of precisely that. It's peer responsibility towards one another, where you're looking at each other and saying, you know. How do we solve this? And what's so extraordinary is that not only did these kids form incredible friendships, but of course the friendship that you form if you've had to overcome suspicion and hatred in order to make that friendship is much, much stronger. As any refugee who has made friends in a foreign country will tell you, there's incredible links to be made between each other when you've suffered, as it were, from a darkness inside your own soul um, towards a person. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gil, this is a big pro subject for you because of South Africa and because of the levels of violence, um, particularly against women and girls in South Africa. And I just, uh, I only wanted to ask you a question about that because I had, a, I had a conversation with somebody there who said that they felt that it was to do with identity and to do with um, the extraordinary loss of identity during the apartheid years um, and that has been replaced with the kind of rage that comes out in this ex very, very deformed violence. What, what, do you have any, any solutions for that or ideas about it? Just to answer you as well, I think um, the people that I work with as well have echoed the same sentiments that it is, there is a problem with the, the levels of violence and we need to know where it's coming from. And that basically links into how young people were, were perceived. You were not given an identity, you were boxed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time that young people are coming out of those boxes and they don't know where they are fitting in. Mm -hmm. And f currently what we are doing in South Africa, I'm working on a project called Identities, as I said earlier. And we're looking away from the conventional methods of doing things and we're trying to link that into what young people are interested in at the moment. And the arts is a big interest for young people. Young people are interested in expressing themselves and there are a lot of talented young people out there. And what we are planning to do in South Africa, 
and all around the world by probably hit hopefully the end of the year for those of you who'd like to fund is a nice idea <laughs> I'd organize a youth international youth arts festival that is run by young people for young people because as Nick said earlier with peer education young people are learning from each other they are learning about each other through each other and I think that is very important and that's what we are doing back in South Africa because young people are actually sick of the violence women are sick of heading up um, single um, single homes because that's what we have at the moment. They are looking for other ways to express their views and their feelings as young people. Good. Uh, j go on, Unan. Yeah. Well, about peer education, I think all of us, when we were back in school, oh, I'm still in school, um, <laughs> have all experienced peer pressure. Mm. Now, most of that is in a negative kind of way. For example, when somebody on your soccer team tells you to be mean to another teammate by not passing him the ball or probably a bully from the neighborhood influences you to go and shoplift with him. But we can actually turn that around. We can use peer pressure in a positive way, and I like to call it peer inspiration. Well, we inspire each other, and I think that's a great way for young people to communicate with each other. And as for youth and global leader um, communication, I've got a wild idea over here. Why not come up with something called the World Youth Forum? So we have a bunch of youth, like tens of thousands of youth at this forum, and the world leaders are the minorities. <laughs> Turn the table around. <laughs> it's a brilliant idea. What? Sorry, Kukwan, yes. No, uh, basically, uh, a way of, of teaching, not teaching, but making, creating active citizens of their societies, creating people who, youngsters who will change and try to change something that they don't like in their society, in their country, in the world, is a means of education. And we must understand that a hundred million children nowadays are not having the, not having the basic needs of education. And education is not only a human right, but it is a means. It is a means of uh, uh, showing the people that of asking their basic rights. It is a means of tackling other global issues such as global warming and poverty. It is a means to to uh, involve them, involve them actively, involve them in being part of that change that uh, we are here uh, in favor of. So that's uh, uh, when because what is basically happening right now in this technology era is that. People, uh, youngsters who don't have access to, uh, to, to education have more access to information but less to knowledge. So that creates only an internal pressure that will only erupt in the form of violence someday. So world leaders and we all here must understand that without education we'll always f we face more poverty, more violence, more social unrest and no for, so for sort of change. I'm enjoying this so much, watching my screen, seeing the World Economic Forum and these kids in front of it. It's fantastic. Emma, you've got a question? I have. Um, now, OK, I, I just have to say, this is not a sort of qualitative judgment, you're, but you're all deeply moral people, OK? This is a given. Um, my question is, um, do you think that, for instance, a business leader can be a moral leader? And what I'm interested in is the fact that over the centuries, you know, the development of business has meant that we've, we've dislocated ethics and morals from the processes of business. Um, I'm interested in seeing this World Get Economic Forum next to committed to improving the, the state of the world. And I wonder how possible that is and how you would, would hold on to your ideals. I'm not being cynical. But you speak about young, you know, what they felt when they were young. They may have felt all sorts of things. But when people start making money and move into institutions which run in very particular ways, um, it, it's sometimes very difficult to continue or to hold on to those principles and those ideals. So that's my question is, is do you think that business can become moral again? Hold that thought. It's a tricky one. Please. I mean, I just Throw another one in, and I've got another question over there as well. Let's yeah. take as many questions so these guys can answer them, because we're going to have to wrap up, I'm being told. Okay. Well, okay. I, I just want to, to add to the, what you have asked. What, I know you are terribly involved socially and have very strong moral convictions and the right aspirations and so on, but how, what kind of a career do you foresee for yourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, I ask this. Because I've gone and talked, thinking about a lot of young people in refugee camps. And when you ask them what they want to do, 
They, want to, they would say, I want to be an engineer, a school teacher, a doctor. They have very definite career aspiration because they think that that's the only way they can really make a living. Now, how do you make a living for yourselves, but also be inspirational for the next generation? Hold that one. Good question. I'm Robert Scoble, and I uh, grew up in Silicon Valley and report for Fast Company magazine. And I'm very inspired by this panel. Thank Good. you very much. I, I have a 14-year-old son, and I wish <laughs> I, I could have him <laughs> meet you and see um, what you're talking about. Part of the problem for, for my son is getting him to see the world's problems because he, he doesn't have any concept of what you, what you talk about, the sexually exploited people or, or uh, you know, a, a family that lives for a, a week on five dollars. He has no concept. He, he can't relate to that. How, how do we put your ideas, your problems in his head so that he can work with you and help you know, uh, it, it inspire me to do better, it, my community to do better. Thank you for that. W each of you are going to get a chance to answer one or all of those questions because we're going to have to wind it up after that. Who wants to start? John. I guess there are all such wonderful questions that I think deserve a lot of attention. But first to start with businesses and saying how, you know, how can we make socially conscious businesses. Well, there are some out there today who are making sure that all their products are fair, fair trade and that there aren't children who are six and seven year olds, year old making them, but that they're made by people who are actually paid a fair wage. So I think if we can remember those concepts and keep those in track. Now for me, for my future career, I really would like to start a school in Africa or India. And I know that that's probably not the best way to make money and hopefully I'll be able to still eat, but that's something I really, really would like to do and I hope that it will be able to also provide a living for me. And in terms of how to bring your children and help them to understand what's going on in the world and educate them, to do that, just sit down with your kids, have a conversation with them, tell them about these statistics, but explain to them also that a statistic is not just a number. That for every number that you learn about, like a million children don't receive education, that's a million people. That's a child who has a mother, a brother, okay. and sisters. Explain to them the full implications of that number. Show them videos talking about these issues. It's your job as parents and as adults to show people, to show the young people what's going on in the world. It's, we have so much power to educate. Use that power. Just before each of you uh, comes in here, does Emma need to go from this panel at this point? Because we're going to probably spend another two or three minutes just winding up. I'm not going. <laughs> Anywhere. Unfortunately, we have the next session waiting outside. Oh. So maybe we can organize this forum Two online. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. And then we'll try and organize something online and we'll get WEF to help us out with that. Guys, keep it really short. Nick. Okay. Uh, to business leaders, I think in a way they have to prove their moral worth by going out and finding the most marginalized people to employ and by funding these type of projects for what kind of career I want. I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. I love it. And whether I get money or not, I'm just going to keep at it. And to answer this gentleman's point, I think education. Go to your school board, go to your te the teachers of your son and say, go and tell my kid about this, because he has to know about it. Good. Juan. We nowadays live in a very materialistic and a very consumist world where everything goes for, oh, I have a good car, I have a good computer, a good iPod, and that's the only thing I care. I think that basically that, suck, that tackles uh, the, both of, the, of these questions. It's not, it's not that people don't have this, this passion. It's not that people don't have this vision, and, and we either. I mean, but the thing is, we, we, we do also care about materialistic things. But I think it's, it's, it's hitting in each person, and each person wants to make a difference for the world. Businessmen, uh, youngsters, all wants to make a, uh, a change in this world because it is the world in which we live in, in which our next generation will live in and the next, next generation will live in. So it is very, very important that we put materialistic things aside and we think what is better for our society, for our country and for the world itself. Thank you, Juan. Um, 
can it, answering the question, can a business leader also be a moral leader? I think a business leader can be a moral leader. Coming from a religious background, I know that you can be anything you want to be if you really, really want it. Also answering about my, uh, my career, I don't, I don't actually know what I'm going to be. Maybe lawyer, but I don't know. But as long as I can make a difference for one person in the world, then I would, have made it, I, then I would be satisfied with having lived my life. Yes. Well done. Kill him. Could we start by saying that um, business leader Swan tried to approach Mr. Bill Gates this morning. He wasn't interested. <laughs> I thank you for being interested as well. Time. Moving on to media. I think with the gentleman over there, your 14-year-old son gets most of his influences from the media, and they are trying to, sh to shape our thoughts. And we are here to tell you today not to let them shape our thoughts. We've got a website called www.roadtodavos.net. Go online. Tell your kids about the website. Tell other young people. They can interact with us. They can interact with you because you can comment. And in terms of careers, I'm doing a degree. I'm hoping to start a degree in social sciences at the University of Cape Town in, on Monday, next Monday. And I'm hoping that I can use my skills and transfer it to as many young people as possible through forums that we created in Davos. Because we are planning to meet again, for those of you looking to finance another project. The Davos, the Green Guildford 60, will meet again at the, in the middle of this year to evaluate our progress, to, to evaluate our challenges. And we will meet afterwards to see what has been successful, why it has been successful, and what can we do better. Well done, Gillian. And Unan, the last word is to you. I would like to answer that gentleman's question before he leaves. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, if you, want your, if you want young people who are not living in a difficult situation to actually feel how difficult it is, you have to have them imagine or even experience the adversity. I mean, okay, for, for example, when I was showing a slideshow on um, how climate chaos has changed the planet in my school, I showed them they didn't care about the retreating glaciers in Switzerland. They didn't care about the droughts or rain or floods in Africa. But when I showed them one satellite picture, well, about um, Beijing becoming a coastal city and Shanghai becoming the next Atlantis because of rising sea levels, they got really interested and they got into the problem and they listened to me talk about climate change for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> the panel. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Brilliant. Thanks, Emma. Thank you.